Amen. The, uh, I realized during the uh, first service that I made a tactical error in how I ordered the service. I should not, as I seek to get better at preaching, follow something like that. <laughs> Forget what you just heard. <laughs> uh, no, if you don't know me, my name is Micah Page. I am the worship pastor here. And one of the things I was excited about coming here to serve, uh, one of the... I don't think I said that quite right. One of the reasons I was excited to come here was because Ron uh, was willing to give me a chance to grow as a pastor uh, holistically. So that included being able to preach every once in a while. And so uh, I have the privilege and the duty to lead you through God's Word this morning. Um, I am hoping that this is a spiritual gift that tests out true in my life, uh, though I know it'll be hard work. My dad was a pastor and preached for over 30 years uh, in a small church, and uh, my grandpa on my mom's side was also a pastor. So Hope I don't break the chain <laughs> in that way. This is the last message in a 12-part series uh, we started at the beginning of the year called Putting God's Power to Work in Your Life. And it's looking at the book of Joshua and all the things that happened uh, as God led the Israelites into the promised land. And it's a powerful and exciting book to read. And I hope that you've enjoyed going through it uh, with us. Now we are in chapter 24, which if you need a Bible, uh, there's some underneath uh, most of the chairs, and it's on page 236 in those Bibles. And we'll be looking uh, a lot at the Word uh, this morning, um, so if you don't have one on your phone, or you didn't bring one with you, then I would encourage you to, to pull that out, because uh, it's great to be able to look at the Word together. I forgot to reset my place from first service. All right. So before we start, uh, I'm going to read a key verse in this chapter. It's verses 15 through 16. And Joshua is talking to the Israelite leaders uh, that he's assembled. And he says to them, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Before we get in, let's pray. Lord, we see from this scripture the choice that is before each one of us. This is not just a distant story that has no bearing on our life. Lord, when we come to your word, we come to know you more. And when we come to know you more and see you clearly, that is the only way we can see anything else clearly. Especially ourselves. And Lord, this story and the context, the history of Israel, we have a lot to learn about our own hearts, the tendencies within it, and how we need to be proactive in seeking you amidst the waywardness and the sin that can so entangle us in uh, the cares and worries of this life. So Lord, help us as we look at your word uh, to get a better picture of who you are. Indescribable, unmistakable, irresistible. Lord, we are here and we need your help to understand and to break through uh, the hardness of our own hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before we get into the actual text, uh, before we start at verse 1 here of chapter 24, let's remember our context, where we are at, what has happened. Joshua took over after Moses died. They came up to the border of the promised land a uh, second time, and Moses was not allowed to go into the promised land because he had sinned in a specific way. Uh, so Joshua took over and brought them in. Before that, the people had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They weren't just... It's not that they didn't know where they were going. It wasn't that they, they took a left instead of a right at Albuquerque. They... They were not allowed to go into the promised land for 40 years because of a specific sin that they had done. Actually, technically, if these people, it was their fathers, their, their parent generation. Their parent generation had been brought up out of Egypt, 
great miraculous signs. God brought them from slavery up to the border of the promised land. On the way, they had complained. They had found so many reasons to uh, grumble against God, amazingly. Every time God showed His mighty hand to provide, they grumbled about something, the water, the food, or, or this guy Moses who thought he was in charge, stuff like that. So what kept God's power, uh, in this case, going in the promised land from them? It was sin that kept God's power from their life. Even though they had rebelled and complained ten times against God on that trip from Egypt to the border of the cross, uh, promised land, uh, it was this last sin that finally pushed them over the line. They had sent 12 spies into the Promised Land. Ten of them came back. It was 40 days they spent in the Promised Land spying it out. Ten of them came back and said, We can't do it. They're really big. They've, they've got walls on their cities. Uh, it's impossible. Our wives, our children, they're going to be taking plunder. So we've got to go back to Egypt. And Joshua and Caleb, two of the spies, said, No, we have God on our side. End of discussion. And they said, please don't turn away from the Lord. And, they, and the people said, oh, well, I guess we'll have to get rid of these guys before we go back to Egypt. So they were going to stone Moses and probably Joshua and Caleb as well. And God came down and showed his glory, said, no more. Forty days you spent spying out the land. Forty years you're going to spend in the wilderness because you didn't believe that I was God, that I could do this. Their disbelief had come out in so many ways uh, over those, uh, the couple years that God had been with them uh, in Egypt, all the way up to the Promised Land, and it just showed itself again and proved itself finally. So, that whole generation that led Israel up to that point fell in the wilderness and died. And it was their children that would go into the Promised Land. And God says, it's the children that you thought you were going to lose in the Promised Land that are going to be the ones that come in and enjoy it. So why did they rebel? They didn't want to hear what Moses was telling them. They were afraid of giants. They wanted it easy, but God never promises easy. In fact, Jesus warned us of the exact opposite. He said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God doesn't ask, God doesn't have a, the troubles of life go around us. Becoming a Christian, a follower of Christ, does not mean you get it easy. What it means is that He's there with you. That's the power of God that we're talking about in this series. Putting the power of God to work in your life to help you through the tough trials of life that will come to all of us. Just look at what Israel did. Israel was freed from Egypt, but while God was freeing them, they were going through horrible treatment, beatings, and uh, hard forced labor. When they came out, enemies came as they went through the nations, came out and attacked them. Very rarely in Israel's history does God just eliminate the, opposite, the, uh, the, the army coming out against them. That does happen a few times, but that's not the norm. Normally, Israel has to go up, get their swords, go out, fight, and defeat the enemy. God gives them the strength to defeat it. He doesn't remove the problems from us. Because it is through winning and going through those hardships and staying true to God that we understand He is really there with us. So, the book of Joshua is after that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. They come into the promised land and it shows how God works through the Israelites to push out the peoples uh, that were there before them and gives them great victories. It's not perfect. They did have some trouble with some gold that was stolen and a guy got burned alive. Um, and they didn't always pray before they made decisions. Not a perfect record. But it was clear when they followed God's plan and relied on Him they were unstoppable. So let's go to Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. This Joshua is coming to the end of his life. It says, Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel. And they presented themselves before God. 
We realize through this chapter that God is not raising up another Joshua to take his place, to be a single mediator between God and the people of Israel. All the tribes are going to be responsible directly to God. These leaders, these judges, elders, and officials of Israel, these were likely children or maybe young men when the people first had come to the border of the Promised Land. So they will remember the drama, uh, God's wrath, the people's rebellion, and the bitter mourning that followed when their parents realized what they had lost. On top of this, they had seen God's glory for 40 years in the wilderness. During their time there, there was a cloud by day leading them, and there was fire by night. Every night for 40 years. That'd be pretty cool. Best campfire ever. So up to this point, they had always had a mediator between them and God. It was Moses uh, and Aaron, or uh, for these last years, it was Joshua. God spoke to Joshua or Moses, and they spoke in turn to Israel. But now, that's not going to be there. Their faith is going to have to be proved even more because they are directly responsible to God. Verses 2 through 12, we're not going to read it all, but God reminds the Israelites how they got here. He chose them, He delivered them, He provided for them up to this point. From Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, to Moses and Aaron, and finally to this day, in verse 13, the results. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil, and cities you did not build, and you live in them, and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. God did everything for them. The Lord is the one who called them, led them, fought for them, and blessed them. He alone is worthy of their devotion. So Joshua challenges the people. Verse 14. Now, fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. The people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord, to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God Himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because He is our God. Great answer. Good. Seems like they're getting the message. Let's hope it sticks. But 19 and 20, kind of an interesting verse. Joshua counters. Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord. It's a very interesting pep talk strategy. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, He will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after He has been good to you. It makes you step back a little bit hearing Joshua talk like this. Uh, I don't think pastors nowadays would usually address their congregations in this way. Uh, we can safely assume, though, that Joshua is not actually intending to dissuade the people from following God and serving the Lord. Uh, but it does remind us of what Joshua witnessed in his whole time of assisting Moses in leading the people out of Egypt. He saw time after time after time that God would provide in a miraculous way, and then weeks later, months later, however long it was, the people are grumbling again over some small problem. Uh, they just could never get it. So, maybe he's warning them, maybe he's bringing that to mind, to their mind, that this is a holy God that will not forgive you. You know because you saw your parents uh, fall in the wilderness. Uh, Matthew Henry, a classic commentator, thought maybe Joshua was mimicking um, the, the arguments that they were going to hear from the nations around them. The nations around them saying, our God is easy. Come over to this grove of trees. Worship Him there. They're fine. They, your God is holy. You're going to get burned up if you serve Him. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true. But it is a good reminder. God is a jealous God in the best possible way. Not like we're jealous of someone else's car. But as a husband is jealous for his wife when someone comes in to try to separate her from him. 
It's God's love for us wanting to lead us to Him in true worship that causes that jealousy. It's not for our, our, it's for our good. But the people said to Joshua, verse 21, No, we will serve the Lord. Good. Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. They replied, Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. At this point this week when I was looking at this passage, I was sitting there scratching my heads. Throw away the foreign gods that are among you. It seems as if after Achan was burned and his family for bringing gold that they weren't supposed to bring into the camp, could it possibly be that people are bringing in foreign gods and worshiping in the camp? So, I looked at some commentators. Looked all the way back to John Calvin. He, he seemed to think it wasn't that they probably actually were doing this. He was inclined to think uh, that reference is made not to their practice, but to their inclinations. That they are told to put all ideas of false gods far away from them. That would kind of fit with his previous comment. Seems counter. Um, it would be ludicrous if they had allowed idols in. Maybe as they went through the cities, they picked up the gold and plunder. It was only that first city that they weren't allowed to take any plunder. So maybe some of the plunder they took were little gods and they kept them. But it seems like Israel had done such a good job of cleansing their camp uh, after Achan. It's probably not the case. It is the tendency to turn away from God. And I have to say to all of us today, isn't this the same caution that we need to have today? I think it would be a shame if we look at the, will, the weaknesses of the Israelites with judgment or with pity and we stop there. When we look at Scripture, we see who God is, His goodness, and we see, we should see, as in a mirror, our own weakness, our own sin. This passage will not draw us any closer to our Savior if we do not recognize the same tendencies in our own hearts. As the prophet Jeremiah observed, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Isn't it true that we enjoy blessings upon blessings from God that probably outnumber our ability to count them and yet become bitter at relatively small inconveniences? Especially when we consider what Christ has done for us. We have our debts paid in full, paid by His blood. Wondrous salvation has been offered to us as a gift, giving us assurance of eternity in paradise with Him. Isn't it tragic when the enemy succeeds in robbing us of our joy so that we, get to begin, we begin looking away from Him, as if true happiness can be found in something else? John Newton told a parable that I updated for us today. Suppose a man was driving to downtown Portland to take possession of a large estate worth several hundred million dollars. And his car should break down a mile before he got to the city, which obliged him to walk the rest of the way. What a fool we should think him if we saw him wringing his hands and blubbering out all the remaining mile. My car is broken. Woe is me, my car is broken. But in the same way, we are headed to paradise with God, eternity without tears, without pain, without fear, and yet the smallest obstacle sometimes can have us turning our gaze away from our God and our Savior. Let's keep going, though. Verse 24, And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey Him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 
and they buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, in the hill country Ephraim, north of Mount Gaish. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. Joshua ends on a pretty good note. They seem to be on the right footing. But that last verse, verse 31, limits it to those who outlived him throughout the lifetime. And you start to think, oh, what happened after that? <laughs> well, next in your Bible is the book of Judges. And it is not a very encouraging picture. In fact, it is a, exactly the opposite. It, sin comes in and destroys everything really quickly. People turn away from God. And if you want to be shocked, if you've never read the book of Judges, you can read the book of Judges and become uh, discouraged at uh, what sin can do to civilization. Let's actually read a little bit. So turn over. It should just be one page over in your Bible. Uh, chapter 2, verses 10 through 15. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook the Lord, the God of their ancestors. who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook Him and served Baal and the Ashtoreths. In His anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them to defeat them just as He had sworn to them. They were in great distress. How can so much be lost in the span of a single generation? This is the power that sin has to destroy relationships and lives. It is sin that separates us from the power of God. In fact, it is the only thing that can separate us from the power of God. God does not pull His power away from us uh, just because it's Tuesday or just because we we've gotten sick or we're tired. God's power is there until we turn away from Him, until we choose sin over Him and His rule in our life. If that is true, then sin will always be our greatest problem. This is something, a, a thought that I realized over this last year when I found myself looking at the sins of others Within the church, unfortunately, this was more than a year ago because I've been here about a year. So just, <laughs> just clarification there. And I realized what others were doing wasn't as big of a deal as my own rebellion against God that happened in my habits and how I let things go. Um, our sin is always our greatest problem. It is the only thing that can separate us from God and His power. What happened in, in the Word, in Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, and Judges, God did not remove Himself or His power from Israel until there was sin present, undealt with. So, if that's true, if sin is always our greatest problem, what do we do? We have to realize what our tendencies of our heart is to go away from God. We have to be actively pursuing Him. Are you devoting time during your week to knowing God? Is your Bible only touched on Sunday mornings? How's your prayer life? By the way, we have a prayer group Wednesday mornings that meets here. It's a good way to start. Are you truly connected with other followers of Christ? We have quite a few small groups. Getting a small group push here pretty soon. It's a great way to grow in that way. Parents, are you teaching your children what it means to follow God? Am I teaching my children, seven years old and three and a half, to follow God? If we ever begin hoping that our kids will learn fully what it means to follow God with just an hour of instruction on Sunday morning, then we are abandoning our duties as spiritual leaders of our home. The worship of God needs to be a daily focus in each of our lives because of the deceitfulness of sin and our wayward hearts. 
God had been with the Israelites for 40 years in the wilderness and through the entire campaign in Joshua. And yet when they took rest one generation later, they forsook him. Judges, like I said, it, it goes, it seems a little wobbly, first chapter, and then it just plummets. And uh, the end of that book is, uh, like I said, a, a shocking entry in God's Word. Um, I remember when I first read it and comprehended it in high school, I thought, this is in the Bible? And I took it and showed my friends that... Uh, at, at my school and they were all surprised I realized later that was probably not the best witnessing uh, <laughs> example <laughs> there's probably other scripture I should have shown them first um, but anyway it is a desperate picture of what sin will do to our society and to our own lives at the end of the day, the power of God in your life is not merely the difference between a weak life and a strong life. It is the difference between life and death. You're either going towards God or you're going away from God. There's, there's no neutral. You can't coast with God. You have to be actively pushing or you'll be slipping. There's some parallels with this story uh, with Palm Sunday. Uh, what we are celebrating today. So I would like to skip over to Matthew, the New Testament, Matthew 21, 1 through 17, and see the difference there. If you're using the, the Bible, none of the chairs, it's page 988. Chapter 21 of Matthew. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet uh, Zechariah. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Written more than 400 years earlier. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees, Palm Sunday, and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Read down through 17. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. Miracles. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? Let's leave it to the worship pastor to find an uh, advertisement for children's choir in Scripture. <laughs> What do we have here? We actually have. The children saw what their parents were doing. They were worshiping God out on the streets. And they learned it. And they went and started worshiping Jesus too. Parents were modeling. Children were learning. Is the worship of God actually modeled in your home? That's something we have to ask ourselves every day. Am I pointing my kids more toward Christ? Am I pointing my family, my parents, my friends, my neighbors? This generation seemed to have it right, or so it seemed. But we have to remember that that same crowd, a week later, called out, Crucify Him. Oh, the deceitfulness of sin. In case you're not a follower of Jesus, uh, I just want to clarify, when we say sin, sin is a preference for anything other than God. We all struggle with it. None of us can overcome it ourselves. 
Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus' death on the cross paid the debt that you and I could never pay. God has made a way for you to be forgiven of your sin and be made right with God. It is a free gift, but it is not a cheap gift, for it costs God his very Son. But God raised him from the grave on the third day, proving that God's work had not failed, and Jesus is coming again someday to take us home to be with him. None of us are promised another day on this earth. So if you have not yet made a commitment to Christ, make that day today. Talk with me, or Pastor Ron, or Pastor Chris, or anyone else, and uh, the, anybody should be able to introduce you to someone else who can talk to you about it more if, if they don't know um, how to lead you further. The power of God is found only in a relationship with Him. It is never found apart from His Lordship in our lives. The only thing that can separate us from Him is sin. If He is truly the giver of all life, then the power of God, connection with Him, relationship with Him, is a matter of life and death, and nothing less. So, we have to ask ourselves today, whom will we serve? Let's pray. Lord, when we come to Your Word, we are convicted. Lord, none of us can come, read about your holiness, your goodness, and not realize that we do not add up. None of us can stand before you without the blood of Christ covering us and giving us his righteousness. We thank you for that gift, Lord. We thank you. And I pray, Lord, that if any of us do not understand that fully, have not yet made that commitment, Lord, I pray that they would make that choice to follow, to serve God, to serve you, and accept this free gift of salvation. Lord, help us, if we are following Christ, to live in your power. That is, live in relationship with you, seeking you, pursuing you daily so as not to fall. And I pray, Lord, that you would draw us ever closer to yourself through your word, through those around us who are following you, and through the service that we perform. Lord, help it all to lead us evermore to you. In Jesus' name, amen.